a big clap. <laughs> right, we're, we're, we're getting going at this. Um, I, I don't know if everybody present finds the title of this um, discussion as incomprehensible as I do. Um, but but um, uh, what we it's, um, it, it seems to me to be entirely applicable to a uh, and relevant to a conference which has been uh, singular single-handedly captured by a demotic post-democratic figure called Boris Johnson. <laughs> um, I, 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 we're going to we have um, a very undistinguished chairman who doesn't know what he's talking about, but we have some very very distinguished panelists and. Um, the first of them is uh, is indeed Jesse Norman, who is uh, well, very uh, rare and unusual and um, bad thing normally uh, a Conservative Party intellectual. Uh, Mr. Norman has many virtues. Um, among them is a an understanding of the philosophy of of, uh, of Matthew, not Michael Oakeshott. Uh, Mr. Michael Oakeshott doesn't have a philosophy, and um, is that the wrong way around? Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I I indeed, we have David Goodhart, who has, um, who's, who was the editor of one of the most boring magazines in Britain called Prospect, <laughs> but but now he's um, now he, um, uh, he he's a director of Demos Think Tank. And uh, Philip Blond, who's uh, director of Ray's Publica, and in has brilliantly sought to synthesize conservatism and socialism in his own valiant personality. Um, we'll kick off, though, on the subject of, um, of, um, like, uh, of the broken society or broken politics with uh, none other uh, than Jesse Norman. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Peter, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You'll be very pleased to have seen in Peter's opening remarks that when uh, Boris steps down from his role as a great post-democratic politician, one Oborn will be ready to fill his, <laughs> to fill his role with the same iron self-control in the chair that we're used to seeing from Boris. Um, uh, well, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Demos. Thank you, uh, Race Publica, um, for this uh, fascinating event. Uh, um, I, I suppose it leads... I suppose it, needs, it is for me to try and stake out some of the ground to be covered by this uh, discussion. And if I may, um, I will do so by uh, taking us back a little bit um, in time to um, the foundation of the welfare state and the argument that that presented between conservatism uh, and uh, socialism. Uh, because it, that was the debate that filled most of the 20th century. Uh, and not just socialism, but uh, a particular variety, Fabian socialism, in which the state had a leading role and intellectuals' job was to guide the state in its, in its task of um, uh, improving society. And uh, when it turned out that this, the state's role in improving society was often to cut out the least well-off and to uh, restrict social mobility and well-being, um, this project, and it was also catastrophically expensive, this project started to grind to a halt. Um, but that argument really merely disguised what in many ways was the deeper argument between conservatism and liberalism. Uh, and I think that's the argument we're really going to explore uh, today. Um, and in particular, it's possible to identify a kind of pathology of liberalism, what you might call a certain kind of extreme liberalism, liberal individualism, as something that comes out of the Enlightenment, um, and which has many um, uh, of a good aspects because it's oriented around a certain conception of freedom and some rather bad ones. Uh, but what I think people miss when they use the word freedom as cavalierly as they often do is that the conservative and the liberal are talking about freedom in two entirely different, or, or I should say not entirely, but somewhat different senses. So for the liberal, freedom is the absence of uh, fetter to the individual will. It's the capacity of the individual to do whatever he or she pleases without being impeded. Uh, and so uh, liberalism in that sense um, is very much focused on the present and uh, the person. Uh, now that is a viewpoint which naturally translates itself into uh, the realm of human rights in a very individualistic conception of 
free, not not a freedom, but a freedoms, individual uh, uh, capacities to do things afforded by the common law or by uh, society or by the state. And from a conservative standpoint, things are completely different. Um, the conservative, what matters is not the individual. The individual is not the primary um, moral actor. Um, indeed, the, the individual is logically subordinate and chronologically subordinate to the state. Uh, sorry, to the to society. And the social order is what comes first. And the effect of that is beautifully uh, captured by Burke's famous thought that uh, society is a compact between the living, the dead, and the yet to be born. And therefore, it is not for any individual to subsume um, this uh, order in an individual act of government uh, that uh, destroys the social order. And it's not for any individual generation to try to help itself to the benefits of the social order which it has been afforded by this great compact. When you see things in those terms, it's very clear that the financial disaster of the last few years is a precise example of a certain section of society just helping itself to a large chunk of the benefits um, uh, without any regard to um, the wider social order. What comes out of this, I would suggest then, is two things. One is a uh, a conception of markets which are not, which are free, but not free as the liberal would see them, but free as the conservative would see them. That is, as institutions mediated by trust and custom and law and practice and um, internal rules. Uh, and uh, not, uh, not, that's on the economic side, but on the social side, a conception of freedom as what is enjoyed in a well ordered society, um, the capacity to discharge one's own capacities and, well, and faculties, um, uh, and not merely, as it were, the freedom to help yourself to the benefits irrespective of others. And if you think of it in those terms, what you will see is an entirely new uh, to the public, but in reality rather old, philosophy which joins a rich conception of human possibility with a rich conception of social capital and social possibility, and that's where I think the future of conservatism is headed. And as such, it is a thoroughly post-liberal philosophy. Thank you very much. That was, um, and that was absolutely beautiful. Uh, Mr. Mr. Norman is currently at work on a biography of uh, Edmund Burke, the um, one and only conservative philosopher. And uh, <laughs> D David, um, David Goodhart is the director of, uh, of Demos. Thank you. I, I would just like to point out that Peter only thinks that Prospect was the most boring magazine in Britain because despite repeated attempts by him to get into the magazine, we never published one of his very long, what would have been very long and brilliant pieces. Um, it is true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, it was, and it was my mistake, my mistake. Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm going to be a bit less philosophical uh, than Jesse um, and try and explain what post-liberalism is as I see it and sort of what its political impact has been even though not many people uh, regard post-liberalism as a, as a existing current in British politics. I think it does exist in both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. I mean essentially through, uh, through uh, Philip's red Toryism and Maurice Glaston's um, blue Labourism. Um, but it certainly um, is not, has not entered, yet entered the political vocabulary, certainly not the term post-liberalism. I mean, very simply, what is post-liberalism? I think it's the belief that the economic liberalism of the 1980s, to get it in the wrong order, and the social and cultural liberalism of the 1960s were both necessary in their different ways, um, but both economic and social cultural movements sort of overshot both of them have um, created unintended consequences. Um, um, perhaps um, the, 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 the pathologies of, of both 80s economic liberalism and, um, and 60s social and cultural liberalism were, were illustrated by the crash of 2008 in, in the financial services sector and by the riots of, of 2011. Um, both kinds of liberalism have, as Jesse was saying, have, have been um, too much in a way about um, reducing constraint and, and too little about or, or taking too much for granted 
the things that bind us together, the glue that binds us together, the things that, uh, that govern our <coughs> dependencies upon each other. Um, I mean, to, to, to give it a simple slogan, perhaps a sort of Tory version um, of, of a, a slogan to describe post liberalism would be one nation economics plus a liberalism of common decency rather than anything goes. I mean, I think that there has been, I mean, if to put it in very crude terms, post liberalism is a kind of market, market friendly social democracy or market friendly one nation economics combined with social conservatism, if that's what it is, um, then I think there is a hidden majority. There has been a hidden majority in industrial societies, certainly in our society, um, for many, many decades. But it's a, it's, a, it's a hidden majority that has never been captured by either of the two main parties. Um, uh, on the left, uh, much of the activist base of, of the political center left um, veered off in a very uh, socially and cultural liberal direction in the 60s and 70s, um, turning its back on, on many of the assumptions and values of the core Labour vote. Um, and the Conservatives, I guess one could say, veered off in the direction of, uh, of a purer form of market economics in the 1980s. Um, so so there, there, there is a majority out there. It's, it's, it's been squandered, in a way, by both parties. Uh, you know, the, the voter, you know, whoever you have been able to vote for in the last 25 years, you get Maggie Thatcher tempered by Roy Jenkins, put it very crudely. Um, I think both um, the Labour and Conservative version of, of versions of post-liberalism share a, a kind of sociological critique of politics too. The politics, again, in the last 20, 25 years has become almost completely dominated by a secular, mobile, liberal graduate elite that most of us here are part of. Um, there's a centre-right version of it and there's a centre-left version of it. Now, you know, much of the time, this, uh, this graduate elite develops policies that are, in, that are in the interest of the whole country. But there are certain points where the interests of that elite and the interests of the rest of the country can diverge. And I think one, one very simple example, in a way, was the, um, was the amount of time and energy and effort that the Labour government expended on trying to reform, well indeed successfully reforming, uh, in many ways, higher education throughout the 2000s. Um, and only now, belatedly, you know, Ed Miliband's speech at the Labour conference was full of talk of intermediate level technical education and so on and so forth. All of that area was um, not completely abandoned, but, but neglected. I and mean, the, the amount of policy time and effort went into higher education compared to the forms of education that are useful to the bottom 50% in society were, relatively speaking, ignored. So we've ended up with a bizarre situation that even before the recession, we had fewer skilled construction workers in Britain in 2008-9 than we had 10 years earlier, despite a building boom, a construction boom in the 10 years preceding that. Um, why, why have we not heard more about post-liberalism? And we've heard quite a lot from Philip, a, a noisy political character. Um, but uh, I, th I think there is a sense of which it's been, it's operated at a level of a sort of meta-political story, a meta-political narrative. Um, it doesn't have a sort of body of policy, neither Maurice Glassman nor Philip, I think, have, have developed a body of policy. Philip will no doubt tell me I'm wrong. Um, okay. Um, um, it, 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 it's, it's strong on the idea of moral community, um, the policies, or, you know, in some areas, perhaps most notably welfare, have departed too far from the moral intuitions of the majority of the population. I mean, policy shouldn't always reflect the moral intuitions of the majority of the population, but, you know, big things like welfare, where we're asking people to put their hands in their pockets and pay lots of money, they probably should. And there, there is now actually quite a broad consensus we should return to more contributory, time-limited um, welfare. Um, the, the IDS welfare bill it's, you know, is, is, is in many ways post-liberal, although it's, it's, uh, it inevitably has many failings. Um, I think the whole, like, the whole idea of, of, of patriotism, of national attachment, is seen as an extremely positive thing, uh, as a great virtue in a, in, a, in a more individualistic era, and something to be, um, to be nurtured rather than to, to be sceptical about, as, as, as many liberals historically have been. Um, 
post-liberalism is skeptical about large-scale immigration, uh, it worries about integration, uh, it's more, more generally skeptical about, uh, about globalization and the distribution of the costs and benefits of it. Um, and it wants to, it worries about the, the pay and the status of many of the um, the irreducibly low-skilled jobs in our society. I and mean, I think, I mean, for, I used to be the Labour editor of the Financial Times, and virtually every week another report would come in saying that all jobs in the future are going to be professional, managerial, highly skilled, uh, and, and unskilled jobs are going to disappear. And I think forever in a day we will have about a quarter to a third of our population will be doing low-status, low-skilled jobs. And we haven't thought enough about how to give those jobs dignity and respect. But this is all. Uh, this is, uh, you know, that these I think would be it would be agreed. I hope are sort of post-liberal themes, but they have not crystallised into um, into a sort of raft of post-liberal policies as yet. Anyway, but I think the, the perhaps the biggest single failure um, I owe this to my colleague um, Max Wynne Cowie is that the real failure is in economics. I mean, obviously, economics has dominated the political agenda for the last two or three years. Post-liberalism does not have a have a serious set of economic ideas. Again, Philip will tell me I'm wrong. You know, he writes a lot about mutuals, but mutuals are not a big economic idea for post-liberalism. It seems to me not a that they, 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 they don't begin to answer the questions. Um, um, on, on the Labour side, on the Morris Glassman side, there's a lot of talk about the German model. We cannot, you know, we can rep replicate little bits of the German mo model, perhaps, but we, we have such a different culture, economic and business culture in this country, we're not going to adopt the German model, even though there are many admirable things about it. Um, so, um, I, I think there's, a, there's nothing particularly new about post-liberalism, like everything, it's a sort of combination, it's a, it's a relatively novel combination of old ideas, um, and I think it, um, it is influencing both parties, it has influenced both parties, it's perhaps easier for post-liberalism to to influence the Labour Party because it came along when the Labour Party was starting again after an election. Um, Phillips had a harder job, I think, in the, in the Tory Party, and also because you're um, you're trying to get the Tories to move sort of left on economics, stay where they are broadly um, on social and cultural things, and move left on economics, which is a harder job than I think it is for um, the Blue Labour to uh, get the party to, to move, you know not exactly to the right, but at least to have more respect for social conservatism. Um, and, and, and you can see it's influencing the, the One Nation stuff and so on. Um, I think, well, just, just a final thought, I think one area where perhaps post-liberalism could sort of perhaps change almost the sort, of, the, the sort of tenor of politics is by being a bit more, a, a bit less squeamish about, um, about telling people how to behave in a way that we assume that, that, that there's an enormous gap at the moment between um, you know, making something illegal, um, you know, banning some practice, and passively acquiescing in it. I mean, I think there are a whole sort of set of areas where, as it were, sort of applying social disapproval um, you know, could, could have an effect. I mean, they're all, uh, one wants to sort of draw up a list of um, well, one example I can give you, because I've just been writing a book about post-war immigration, and one of the one of the very big issues in places like Bradford is first cousin marriage amongst the Kashmiri Pakistani population, which is creating um, a huge amount of genetic disability um, amongst second, third, and even fourth generation Kashmiris. Now, you don't necessarily want to make cousin marriage illegal. I think you know, it would be, be, be a difficult thing to do, but uh, uh, you know, an, an expression of severe disapproval um, um, but you know, because it, you know, it, it has you know, hugely, it's a huge self-inflicted wound. Um, and at the moment, the you know, liberalism has, you know, the professional, you know, the, the mainly white professional class in, in Bradford is very, very cautious about expressing any sort of judgment about this when it is, you know, it's clearly damaging a community. Anyway, I will stop there, and you can um, tell me where I'm wrong. Thank you. Um, great pleasure to be here, not least to hear uh, a wonderful, pithy and, and, ve and very moving statement from Jesse and um, about what a post-liberal conservative politics and <coughs> philosophy need to be. 
and then also a description from David of, uh, of its present traction. In order to add to the debate, what I'd like to do is, is take us quickly to what the consequences of liberalism are. Because one of the reasons I think David is right is the reason why, kind of, as, as Peter so, so astutely said, post-liberalism is not going to move the masses, so we need to come up with a new name. But, but it's worth saying that there's something that's gone wrong profoundly in our society. And what I want to suggest to you is it is liberalism. And liberalism has destroyed the traditions on the left, and on the right and is operative on both left and right and in effect is our ruling value system. Now if you have liberalism as your first philosophy and your ruling value system you literally philosophically believe in nothing but yourself and if you believe in nothing but yourself philosophically you don't really believe in anything at all and I think it's not accidental that most of our elites are valueless, self-serving and laugh at tradition, laugh at any notion of, uh, of patriotism, of commitment, and um, have become essentially a group that is entirely absent of virtue. Now, the reason why democracies have elites and the reason why societies created virtue is actually we need to be governed by virtuous elites. And we used to be. We used to be governed by people who believe not just in themselves, but in each other and their locality and their commitment. And we've stripped that away. And we're in a society now where most, of, not all, because there are notable and magnificent examples, but most of the people who govern us don't really seem to believe in very much at all. Now, that isn't accidental. It's a historical outcome from the triumph of liberalism. So let me just take you through, if, if, if I may, uh, what I think the consequences of liberalism are. Well, first of all, it's an oscillation. We have been governed, I, I would argue, uh, post-Second uh, World War by an oscillation between extreme collectivism and extreme individualism. And we believe that left-wing people are different from right-wing people. But in terms of this, they are not. Actually, the reason why we feel we've been governed by the same order and we produce unaccountable elites, massive concentrations of power, the destruction of working class life, the destruction of working class communities, the obliteration of the notion of service, and essentially the creation of elite that owes nothing to anybody, is actually left and right politics have been very, very similar. Let me lead you through this, if I may. So I think most of, uh, most of you here will agree that we have in some sense been governed by collectivism. But extreme collectivism is a liberal inheritance. Where does it come from? Go back to Rousseau. Rousseau began by, say, by saying, you know, man is born everywhere in chains and arguing that we were authentic, self-creating spirits emerging from the ether. And then he ended in the general will that said everybody must think like me and if they don't think like me they lose moral value. Because what liberalism says is in the first place there's an individual, we universalise that individualism, then all individuals have to be the same. And we see this in current policies, for instance, about the idea of equality, everybody must be the same in order to fulfil universalism, so we destroy difference. And we also see it in our practices. But let me articulate it sort of more simply. If we create a society where only individuals compete, only strong, strong individuals will essentially win everything. And those that don't win will need to create a welfare state or a status settlement in order to pick up the pieces. So a purely individualist economy is actually a statist economy. Libertarianism, which has ruined the rights in America, is actually hand in glove with a form of statism that makes welfareism and welfare support necessary. And the same thing happens if we run a purely, a purely uh, collectivist society from the beginning. As I've said before and often, travel around Eastern Europe and you see the legacy of communism, which was make, meant to make us all love one another, actually despise one another and they're ruined by individual criminal groups and criminal gangs. So what I want to tell you is liberalism is fundamentally wrong because it gets where we come from wrong. We are individuals born in relationship. We begin in society. We emerge from society. In fact, the idea of human beings being asocial doesn't even make sense. We wouldn't even have a language. And the true conservative position is, I think, really well outlined by what Jesse said. The true conservative position is, is the social order, the order that civilizes us, the order within which we create institutions, the order that gives us virtue, goals, and teleology. And if we lose that, we lose everything. So let's go to the costs of social and economic uh, liberalism. Social liberalism has largely been a war waged on taboo by the left. And I think it's interesting that it's the left 
that first created individualism, because it was the left that first created with its 1960s plays, its look back in anger, it's the idea of individual rights entitlement, and it used the state to say, actually, we don't need two-way rights entitlement. We don't need the notion of duties. You just get what you have regardless. And that notion that collectivism produces a self-seeking individual, you see in the, in the 60s, in the 1960s, were the idea that anything that made an imposition on me, anything that limited me, anything that challenged my fundamental wish to realise myself was some illegitimate import. Well, let me read you out some of the consequences of, of this uh, articulation that, that we now face. Um, roughly speaking, since 1997, a uh, single mother has seen an increase in benefits of 85%, whereas for, one per whereas for a two-parent uh, family with two children, the tax burden on them is 39% higher in the UK than anywhere else in the OECD. A third to a half of all children at what British children at one time live in a one-parent family. Um, the time uh, a child uh, uh, experiences a one-parent family is actually the most acute moment of stress. The OECD did a survey in 2010, and Britain came bottom for children's well-being. And the top fear for children was the breakup of their parents. And marriage matters. Why does marriage matter? Because married people stay together longer than unmarried people. By the time a child is five, 43% of unmarried parents have broken up versus 8% for married couples. So what I want to suggest is the family is not a reactionary institution. It's actually a deeply progressive institution. And the idea that we can forego these is part of what is called the atomization and the destruction of life at the bottom of our society, which we have unpicked. And once the, working, the, life, the structured life of the British working class was unpicked, once men owed nothing particular to women, and women were owed only something by the state, what happened is women were abandoned, were left alone, and that's why you find the greatest degrees of suffering actually at the bottom where women are left doing several jobs, raising children, earning a wage, without any notion of reciprocal help. So the destruction of reciprocity, the destruction of family, the destruction of community at the bottom and the idea that social life isn't governed by values and nor should it be is what has helped to produce the type of society that we have today. And then we see the legacy of economic liberalism and the legacy of economic liberalism is even more perverse because I agree I'm with Hayek. I believe the aim of a conservative economics has to free us from serfdom. But if you read Hayek, what you have is an idea that capital, power, money and wealth should be distributed across all, all of society. The capitalism, because it grants property, it grants liberty, and I agree with this, and actually it disperses across the system, and then we don't need welfare because we have a self-sufficient polity where people have economic and social power because they have capital. That's what I agree with, but that is not what we have produced. What we have produced is a new form of serfdom. And that new form of serfdom is where free market practices run counter to free market principles, but economic liberals on the right don't recognize that. Actually, the real Marxists today are economic liberals who proletarianize not just working class people, but increasingly the middle class as well. The return to wages of, as a proportion of GDP for labour has been falling since 1968. And how have we made up the difference? With debt and welfare. And we produced, again, that similar oscillation between statism and individualism. And that has broken Britain. And what we, are, what we have to do, and I take David's point that we haven't yet developed a fully articulate post-liberal economics, but I think it's coming. What we have to do is create a form of capitalism that doesn't concentrate, that doesn't create new elites, new oligarchical and cartel and monopoly type functions that essentially owe nothing to anybody. We have to create and we have to relocalize capital. We have to redistribute it, not through the state, but through the market itself. And I think liberal, post-liberal economics will actually deliver a more liberal economic future. And the same thing on, on the social and cultural uh, polity. Actually, social structures like the family are the most progressive structures. And it's the recognition that actually social conservatism is the only route to stability and progress 
for people is what really matters. Because when people don't have a fully functioning family, I don't want to criticise them. I don't want to have politics that criticise gay people or one-parent families. But I do want to create a possibility of health so we can, or a model that suggests this is how we can help solve that. And that's always mimicking family structures. That's why young people who are in real trouble join gangs. It's not because they're violent or want to be violent. It's because they're mimicking family structures because they need some form of stability. So the real task and the real key, and I think Jesse's work is important, as the, it, it, it is vital really for this, as is David's, is creating the new post-liberal policies on the social side, the new post-liberal economics uh, on, on the conservative side. And I think that's clearly the future of politics. One of the reasons I think that we live in such interesting times is, whatever you think of Ed Miliband, that speech was a move to a majority politics. And I think Ed Miliband, whatever one thinks of what was really going on, I thought it was a bit odd that it was one nation but no conservatives were in it. But leaving, leaving that aside, that is a move to the new politics. And what worries me about where the Conservative Party is now is it's increasingly retreating from what was originally visionary to making another minority offer. And, and the Conservatives have made a minority offer for the last three elections, not including the 2010 one, and didn't get anywhere. And if we retreat to that, that's the result. Post-liberal politics is the future majority of any party. And as soon as we can start to develop those policies on the right, the sooner we'll have a majority in our own right. Thank you. David Goodhart, do you agree with that uh, social analysis? I think what he's talking about, uh, I've been thinking all through this, these discussions, is post-social liberalism. And do you agree with, I mean, you've studied a great deal of the, uh, about the, the social conditions of, of post-war Britain. Do you agree with uh, Philip Lon's analysis? Um, I do, yeah, um, largely. Um, I, I think he's, uh, you know, this whole vein of ideas is, as I said, there's nothing particularly new under the sun. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an original combination, which I think does answer some of the the, the problems that have emerged in the last two or three decades. I mean, we've been through periods ra really rapid and wrenching social change, um, and I, you know, we're, we're, you know, we are a liberal society, and we're a very individualistic society. We've always had a very strongly individualist tradition, and I hope we will continue to be both a liberal society and an individualistic one. But we've we've always also had sort of countervailing traditions to that. Um, that, have, that have stressed, you know, obligation and duty and community and all those things, and those have been substantially weakened. Now, you know, that may be kind of inevitable in some degree. It's an inevitable uh, expression of, you know, 60 million individual choices. Um, um, but we have, you know, we, I think we have damaged our, our institutions in, in, in some ways, and we've moved too fast in some areas. Um, you know, Large-scale immigration is, is perhaps the most obvious and striking. I mean, the, 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 you know, a kind of liberalism or, or a kind of liberal thought was ruling Britain when um, when the decisions were made. A, a kind of liberal thought that that thinks of people as kind of blank sheets. Um, that that thinks that communities don't really exist um, in any meaningful sense, and therefore, if suddenly the demography in a, of an area changes. Well, what's the problem? Um, you know, all, all that's happening is, is that you know, the useful contribution to our labour market is happening. Um, it, was only, it was only people who had a, a very sort of shriveled notion of the society they lived in, I think, that, that could have made those decisions. Um, and I think um, that, that there is good discrimination and there's bad discrimination. Um, and um, you know, and we've we've moved a long way. You know, this is the, the, the great positive inheritance of the, of the 60s and 70s. You know, we have we've ended a lot of bad discrimination, race and gender and other forms of discrimination. But we've sort of thrown out the baby with the bathwater in some ways. Um, and you know, the, 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 you know, the the very notion of discriminating you know, has become um, a difficult one to defend. And I think in many areas. We do need to be more overtly morally discriminating. I mean, sort of, it's easier said than done, and there are you know, often problems with it. But um, I think we, we, um, yeah, we could do with a, a dose of post-liberalism. I'm going to um, 
I'm afraid it actually opens the floor in a second. I just want to very briefly say to uh, Jesse, so what Philip Blonde is saying is that the modernising wing of the Conservative Party um, got it, uh, you know, which captured the party with Michael Portillo and uh, co about 10 years ago, uh, got it wrong. That may be true, Peter, but can you just remind me why? Yeah, what I, I interpret them as being socially liberal. I think that the socially liberal wing of the Conservative Party won the battle okay. in 2001 uh, and, and, and continued to command the heights of the Tory party. Right. Okay, um, I understand, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, um, well, I think there's a degree of truth in that. The, um, one of the weaknesses in the phrase post-liberalism is that actually um, there's, a, there's a natural liberality to conservatism um, in its respect for the notion of liberty, human liberty, liberty of a life lived well within the social order. Um, it's the pathology of liberalism that creates the problem. Um, now, post-pathological liberalism isn't a very good, isn't a very good phrase, um, but um, it, it, however that may be, um, the political agenda was, a lot of it was about seizing certain hot-button cultural issues um, and replaying a socially liberal message for political purposes around those. It wasn't really about in my view, a sustained engagement with what the true sources of human well-being are in society and how those might be realised. And, and as a result, it probably wasn't as authentic as that kind of reconsideration would have been. Anyway, that's um, that with the panel for the time being. Well, uh, questions from the floor, please. Um, yes, please. Here we are. No, we're bringing the mics to bringing you. Bringing the mics. Yeah. Oh, it's coming from there. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Maureen Powell, Chairman of Monmouth County Council. Mine's not exactly a question, it's showing something for you to discuss. I lived through the last war, so I'm getting on a bit, and I've had a lot of experience of the ups and downs of their social life and of politics, and I've seen a lot of things happen. And I always think that however you intellectuals can talk much better than I can, there are things that, are, that matter, the simple things in life. As you say, with children, they need to have a stability. But liberalism, freedom. People cannot use and enjoy freedom unless they've learned discipline first. Because you just turn them loose, they're like a load of small cars being put in the field. They run around, they bump their fences, they don't know what they're doing. And I wondered what you felt about that, that you have to have some sort of structure and discipline before you give people freedom. Thank you. Well, about another couple of questions, and I will. Yes, sir. Toby Young. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of how illiberal post-liberals are prepared to be. Um, so could the panel tell us what they think the post-liberal position on gay marriage is? Um, one more question. Yes. How far are the travers, Jeremy Thomas, trustee of the Boot Group, how far are the troubles and travails of our society rooted in the fact that we long ago lost a common moral philosophy or, or a consensus about moral philosophy. In the 19th century, very briefly, the ethic of our political class was rooted in the classics of Greece and Rome because we saw ourselves, as Gibbon had said in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, as the new Rome of the successors of Rome. And thus we had the class a classical education as the common knowledge of our political class. All of that is long gone with the empire which it was supposed to justify. How in this post-liberal age are, do we, how far do we need a common, uh, some, some kind of agreement um, on a, a moral philosophy that society can accept and follow? Um, and how do we get there? Thank, uh, thank you. That's, uh, th th three questions. One is, in order to enjoy freedom, do we have to be disciplined first? Uh, secondly, I think all uh, gay marriage, the whole you know post-liberalism and gay marriage, and the question of a common moral philosophy. David Goodhart. Um, uh, gay gay marriage, gay partnerships. Um, I I think gay partnerships are fine. I think um, what is it that comes before gay marriage? 
partnerships. Civil, civil partnerships. Um, and, and I think gay marriage is fine, but equally, I think if you know, if, if particular churches um, you know, don't believe in it and don't want to conduct them, then I, you know, I think they also have the right not to. Um, you know, if that isn't fudging it too much. Um, um, norms. Um, I mean, it, we are, you know, we are in an incredibly different society to the one we were, you know, in the in the late 19th century, we are a much, much more liberal society. And part of the point of liberalism is that, that, that people do have different and indeed sometimes conflicting goals. And I think, you know, we're way past the time when we can, sort of, we can go back and have the kinds of, of kind of sort of moral cohesion that we had in the 19th century. And I, I don't think it's desirable. Um, but I think, we, I think we do need more, you know, I mean, I think we have overshot in this area in, in many ways. And I think um, we need we need um, more explicit common norms in, 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 in many fields. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and actually, you know, a, a, a more, I mean, for all sorts of complicated historical reasons, we've never had a very strong um, <coughs> discourse of sort of liberal nationalism um, in, in Britain. I think you know, it was perhaps captured by the Danny Boyle um, Olympic opening ceremony and all that. I mean, I think that that now has sort of become possible. Um, politicians don't seem to be able to do it. Seem to need um, not very good filmmakers to do it. Um, uh, but it, but it has happened, and I think I think that's rather a good thing. I think it gives us a sort of frame in which to sort of you know, in which to talk about our, our, our both norms and almost sort of you know forms you know the fact that we like our own sense of humour and things like that that gives us sort of a sense of, of a common life in a way in, in this country which I think has has disappeared. Um, and and, a, and a, a final point. I mean, I, yeah, I agree with the lady about character. Obviously, um, how one how one does that in in schools and in in helping people bring up children. I, mean, I, I don't know the details of, but it, it does seem to be. An obvious area that, that kind of liberals have shied away from. The liberals that tend to dominate the education system have not, you know, have not thought hard enough about the extent to which the education system is also about the creation of character, or, or, or helping parents to, to, to um, you know, to, to persuade their children to defer gratification and to, um, and to become grown-up human beings. Uh, well, one other thing I meant to say in my, my opening remarks is this: this whole business about mobility. I mean, we are. We, we're, we're ruled by a mobile secular liberal graduate elite. I mean, the, the whole, you know, again, in most of us here, it happened to, but we, when you become a graduate, at least until quite recently, when that allowed lots of people to go to university close to where they live, but the whole point about it was that you were sort of ripped out of a particular family in a particular community, and you went away. I mean, it was as if we were still training people to run an empire in some ways. I mean, that's perhaps a bit of an exaggeration, but and you, you kind of lose a sense of the local. So you know, a lot of our elite is, is deterritorialized. I don't just mean people that kind of run the financial sector, but you know, you know, the people that run our educational um, establishments will often have come from a different part of the country. I mean, you know, in, in, obviously in some sense there's nothing wrong with that, but it means that people are, are often not rooted in... I, I came across the most amazing statistic the other day that nearly 50% of the population live, is it, five miles from where they lived when they were 14. Or is it 14 miles away from where they lived when they were five? I can't remember. I, I think it's five miles away from when they were 14. Um, and you know, there's this, you know a great mass of the population that is that kind of is 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 very immobile and wants to be immobile in many ways. I mean, and you can be quite socially mobile and geographically immobile, which you know w w you know would be a desirable outcome in my view. Sorry, I've, I've gone off the track slightly. That's um, Philip Blond. Thanks. Uh, gay marriage. My own position, I'm against gay marriage. And the reason I'm against gay marriage is because I'm a conservative liberal. Because I think we've got a form of liberalism now that says, in order to be free, be free we have to be alike. And in the name of equality, we're destroying difference. And for me, liberty is about difference. And I actually find gay marriage a form of homophobia because... What it essentially is saying is, is homosexuality has so little integrity that it actually has to be understood only in heterosexual terms. So in that sense, uh, I actually I oppose uh, gay marriage uh, for what I think are 
pretty sound reasons. Because I think the needs to belong to heterosexuals, a form of association and a form of sanctity, that belongs to them qua their heterosexuality. Just as I believe there needs to belong to something uh, to homosexuals qua their homosexuality. Now, this is non-liberal because I believe all human beings have a certain integral essence or quality or something that makes them unique. And if you think there's nothing unique about us, then, then actually sex is just a point on a spectrum and it doesn't matter where you sit. But if you think there is something integral about us, and since sex is fundamental to human relationships, then there should be a certain pattern, a certain institution, a certain form of character associated uh, with sexual relations. And I actually, in, uh, and I'm in favour of civil partnerships, and I see no uh, no mitigation of prejudice through uh, through making uh, ma all marriages in effect gay, which is what it would be. In fact, I can see that as a recipe for prejudice. But I actually also believe, and this is more radical than the churches. I believe gay partnerships should be blessed in church. And I think, I think uh, that gay, strong gay relationships are sanctifying, are ennobling, and I think what we need to do is create a structure that sanctifies them but protects their difference. Because the last thing we want as conservatives is to let equality destroy difference. That's what the socialists do. So that, I think, is a post-liberal position on gay marriage. On, on the points you raised earlier, which I think were lovely, about discipline, of course you're right. Of course you're right. And this is the point I want to make, and, and I know people hate the word paradox, so forgive me, but paradoxically, post-liberal politics are the truly liberal politics. Because only if you... Ha true liberalism can only come from conservative principles, because true liberalism is only about, I want to be free you know, with respect to what I believe in, my family, my, my locality, my structure. If freedom is first, then there's nothing to be free about. Because you, even to be something rather than something else is a form of unfreedom. Because I'm not a rhinoceros, I'm not a goat, I'm not a, a cup of um, cold coffee. So even to be something is a form of not being anything else, it's a restriction of freedom. So therefore freedom always emerges from a prior conservative position. And then uh, I think the really interesting question as well about moral code. I mean, what I think is interesting is when you talk about morality, everybody immediately thinks you want to repress them, and they immediately think you want to repress them in the sexual sphere. They immediately think it's something about policing sexual behavior, and it somehow limits you. But this isn't the classical meaning of morality. Morality, in the classical Greek sense, was what you want to be, what human flourishing is. Morality is saying to, to kind of working class kids in Liverpool, you know what, you can really make it, let me help you. What do you want to be? How, how do we create the conditions for you to flourish? So I want to free morality from the idea that it's immoral and talk about morality as human flourishing and the conditions that we need for that. And that's the only way to make morality popular again. Because if you can make morality about general, the general, you know, how can I put it, achievements of all of us together, then it'll be popular. And actually, if you go, if you forgive the historical remark, morality only became unpopular when it left the world and took up residency. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not going to try and engage with that tour de force from Philip. Um, very quickly on the points the la lady raised, um, uh, the need for rules and structure, yes, absolutely, this is a profound conservative insight. There can be no um, freedom without rules and order. There can be no creativity without constraints. Um, and uh, when you make that move, you are actually moving without realizing it into a different conception of a human being because you're moving away from the idea of, um, uh, as it were, absence of value towards some notion of um, uh, uh, um, <coughs> distinctive functioning of the human being. And then you're also moving towards a notion of character and habit and away from the idea of incentive um, as a guide to conduct. So you're taking out this kind of economically liberal conception and moving towards, I would consider, more authentically conservative view of, of human flourishing. Um, uh, on gay marriage, um, we've had both views, Toby. My view is um, both positions are compatible with the conservatism. Actually, you can, you can be a conservative and take seriously the... Um, 
the, the point about equality in, in front of the rule of law and in front of, as it were, social parity and social esteem, in that sense, absence of discrimination, that would be, a, I think, a reasonable conservative position. Um, or you can take seriously the uh, institution of marriage that's been handed down so far and the institutions and norms by which it's mediated, in which case you'd come out the other way. So I don't actually think there's a kind of knockdown argument either way from the position that we've been describing. And that's one of the things that makes the argument so vexed from an intramural perspective within the conservative um, clan, if you like. Um, a common moral philosophy, well, of course, some, the point you make about uh, classism is not interesting. In the empire of Boris, I've no doubt, all will be restored um, to um, its uh, perfect uh, prelapsarian 19th century beauty. Although I don't recall it being enormously beautiful at the time. I wasn't there, but it, certainly, you know, the Victorians didn't invent democracy, but they rather perfected it. Um, um, so um, I think the point I would make is that we're very um, inept in thinking about moral communities and norms. And um, one of the counterparts of what we call post-liberalism is a, is a conception of, of moral norms is all based on the notion of autonomy and mutual respect and um, freedoms in the sense we've described. And what we miss, I mean, there are several things we miss, but one thing we miss is the notion of the sacred. And then when we get the idea of sacred coming up, we can't really account for it. We haven't a, a mechanism within this liberal conception of understanding how the notion of the sacred actually works, because it's appealing to a set of moral values which haven't been built into the picture. So a classic example of that would be, you can take an impeccably liberal American in that sense, and you know, sure, I believe in tolerance, I believe in you know, human well-being flourishing, you do your thing, that's absolutely fine. And then you say, um, oh, that's okay, I'll just burn this flag, American flag, while we talk, and they get completely nuts, you know. Um, um, and, and it's hard to explain why that should be the case, unless there really is another thing going on which they don't recognize in their own moral system. And being explicit about that allows us to be clever about the recovery of a distinctly conservative set of norms. <laughs> Um, and I should say the mutual respect which goes with an acknowledgement of other kinds of norms or other systems of norms. Yeah, I um, may, your, your comment makes me wonder whether we, po by post-liberalism, we aren't really talking about post-secularism. But that's a, that's a, uh, uh, three more, a few more questions. Um, hi, actually, um, I'm Michael Blunt, I'm a parliamentary researcher. So I, I actually feel that I want to stand up for liberalism, and I don't feel that the way you've construed it is, is philosophically very fair. Um, so actually, I, I think, I think uh, what, what's happened is you've you, is you confused sort of the, the outcome of liberalism with lots of the processes that you might associate with it. So liberalism, I, I, take, to come from, I, I take to come from Mill, and the ultimate idea of the ultimate outcome of liberalism is to bring about sort of a, a, a well-being and happiness. And then there's this sort of, um, so there's Philip Blonds at a, a attack of, uh, sort of what, what, what liberals were doing in the 60s. So that's, um, you know, that's kind of allowing things and, um, and insisting on certain rights. But that's, that's not quite what, what, what liberalism is about. The, the, and the, ultimate, act, uh, the ultimate aim is to, is to bring about happiness and, and well-being. And then how you actually do that. I mean, you, so, you, so liberals can disagree about you know, how, how you bring, you know, how, how, how that happens. And um, I actually want to, I also want to criticise uh, conservatism, so big C conservatism. I think that part of the problem that the, the panel are kind of struggling with this idea of this post-liberalism comes from the fact that um, uh, kind of society so yo-yos from, goes too far one way and then yo-yos back, um, back in the other way. I think this is, you know, this is the problem that, that all conservative face, this is, this is Hayek's criticism, that actually conservatives, they don't have a particular idea of where they're trying to get to, they just know that they're not really happy with sort of what's happened before. And so I think liberalism has the answer, and the answer is that we want to. What we want to do is focus on achieving happiness and well-being, and the important thing to debate is uh, how we go about getting there. Um, a question. One clap for liberalism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, hi, Thomas Byrne. Um, I think that Philip's critique of Thatcherism has been very good. Read your article, you've read your book. Um, I think a big weakness of the Conservative Party is they embrace the economic liberalism of Thatcher, but they've not embraced the other side of it. So there's no big policy like council house sales because the state owns nothing anymore. You know, there's, there's no pro property for people to earn. Is there any way that the state can do that without actually having to redistribute or take control of things to give back to people? Do, 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 do what? <laughs> Uh, a big part of Thatcherism was distributing property, yeah. so council houses... Distribute, the way the sector distributes property, you mean? Yeah. yeah. 
Hi there, Mark Gettleson. Um, prisons and criminal justice. Very few ideas came more out of the Enlightenment in terms of domestic policy than the idea of the prison as an institution. You know, Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, etc. And all of the experience since then, uh, in terms of outcomes, has been this sort of great instrument of the state for reforming people, has been a fairly total and utter disaster. Um, I mean, the prison population doubled under the last Labour government because it was seen to be a good thing to do with, peop uh, to do with people who were um, causing antisocial behaviour, etc. What I'm particularly interested in, what is a post-liberal approach to non-violent crime in particular? There's a broad consensus around what you do with violent criminals, but for the more than 8 out of 10 crimes that land you in prison for non-violent offences, what is the post-liberal approach? Is it a pre-enlightenment approach? Thank you. One more question, perhaps? No, uh, we'll take those as the last two questions. Is, um, so it's, is this, what, can this, what is a big idea to, to, to reconfigure the state, to sort of give um, away property? Yeah, so in the 1980s, um, property... Yeah, like away. council house sales, yeah. Well, the state doesn't actually own any property or anything to actually give away. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, what is the post-liberal uh, point of view about non-violent crime and whether people should be locked up? Um, David. All right. Um, um, well, I have to confess, I haven't um, thought very much about penal policy for, um, um, for a very long time, if ever. Um, uh, but, uh, I mean, I think... Um, uh, prison has, has worked rather worryingly well, um, actually, is, is, is part of the problem here. Um, the prison population seems to have gone up more or less correlated with crime going down. I mean, a, a fact that is very difficult for, for liberals to accept, but it seems to be there pretty much in black and white. Um, I do have one, one penal idea, which I think I, I will christen a post-liberal one, um, which is I do not understand why we don't take advantage of the fact that some of the least well-educated people in our society are trapped in these places, you know, from anything from a six months to, to decades, and yet we do nothing to incentivise them. That's not entirely true, in fact, we do, but, um, but virtually nothing to incentivise them to get an education. A vast number of, of regular returning criminals are, um, are illiterate, um, why do we not incentivise prisoners to get w with reduced sentences? You know, if, you, if you're in for five years, if you get five GCSEs, you get six months or, or a year off your sentence. Um, seems to me a good idea, and therefore I will call it a post-liberal one. Um, yeah. um, Gets the approval uh, of the... Uh, <laughs> um, um, on, on, I mean, housing is actually... Um, I, I, your point about you raised housing. I, I, I mean, housing is actually a, a, a sort of crucible for the failure. Uh, it's another example of the of the overshoot of liberalism, public housing, public and social housing in particular. Um, again, it, it relates very much to the um, post-colonial immigration story. We had tradition um, from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century of having, you know, these these great public authority. Um, housing estates, um, which were mainly for the sort of upper working class, um, and when post-colonial immigration happened, very few immigrants had access to um, to these these places, to, often rather good places to live. Um, they didn't enjoy the you know the subsidised rents and so on that went along with living in public authority housing, because there were. As it were, sort of communitarian sons and daughters policies that meant that you could hand hand on your your kind of right. It was part of the kind of welfare state to the upper working class, the right to a to a to a council house or flat, um, and th there was obviously a problem there. You got you got new populations coming in who ended up in the in the slum clearance areas, and um, that was clearly unfair in some ways. Um, but we kind of we then learned lurched from one extreme to another. We then had at the end of the 70s the Race Relations Act in 77 or 76 rather, and the uh, the Homeless Persons Act, which was actually a result of the famous Ken Loach, um, Kathy Come Home documentary. We moved to a policy of need, 
regardless of who you were, how long you'd lived in an area, it became a completely sort of abstract liberal policy. And you know, one can understand why people did it. I would have probably been in favour of it myself at the time. But it created a new set of distortions. Um, it, we should have done something that, that was kind of more gradual and evolutionary, that, that opened up public authority housing to some of those in greatest need, but didn't chuck out the really rather good communitarian sons and daughters policy, um, which irony of ironies, in, in Tower Hamlets, where, where public authority housing is now entirely Bangladeshi <laughs> dominated, they brought back sons and daughters policies um, for the, the Bangladeshi Tower Hamlets population in 2010. And, you know, and, 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 and good thing too in some ways. Um, and there is a huge amount of resentment, uh, in, in particularly in, in white working class Britain. There's something that the government used to do called the Community Something Survey. It comes out every two years and it asks people about, um, uh, about relations between ethnic groups and about discrimination and things like that. And the, and the group in Britain that feels most discriminated against on any subject is white British people in housing. Like 26% of white British people feel they have been discriminated against in the allocation of social housing. And we've just completely copped up the system you know, in the name of a sort of, you know, an abstract needs-based liberalism. Very interesting. Jesse Norman. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, on the point of liberalism that you raised, um, you'll recall that in Mill's System of Economy, he says that um, in economics we attend only to the individual as um, regards a gain or loss. And that is the beginning of neoliberalism. That's the beginning of the point at which um, economics um, is launched as a quantitative discipline, intellectually launched as a quantitative discipline. And you get an enormous amount of interesting economics out of that, some of which is, in fact, a lot of it is extremely useful. Um, but you also get, in its pathological form, a misunderstanding of human nature, and you get feedback loops into culture whereby people start to regard economic man as somehow the full position for how human, human beings actually are. And there's a lot of evidence on this, um, money priming and things like that, and uh, people becoming greedier when they've been exposed to economic undergraduates who may know have a reputation, and there's some evidence of this, become greedier because they do economics. Um, so there are cultural feedback loops. Um, um, so I'm, I'm afraid I disagree with you about uh, Mill. I, I think Mill actually, with the exception, with one exception, Mill has the extraordinary distinction of never having got anything right. Um, the one thing being his attitude towards women, which of course was Harriet Taylor rather than him. Um, uh, Hayek is much more of a conservative than people recognize. You should pay no attention if you're minded to, to his essay, Why I'm Not a Conservative. Actually, he's extremely conservative, particularly in um, the Constitution of Liberty. Um, and it's Hayek, of course, who says, um, and no one can be an economist who's only an economist, and no one, you know, um, we, essentially his conception of individual is precisely that as, uh, he used the word determined, but he really means conditioned by society rather than, um, as it were, um, determined or, in, or indeed individual. On distributing capital, I have nothing to say about that. I, um, there is no, there's nothing in the kitty, and the principal need at the moment is to make sure that society as a whole um, is able to create an order which allows adequate living standards for all members of society. We're miles away from being able to recapitalize the least well off. Let, let's start with the process of allowing people to get a decent wage and a decent living for, uh, for a hard day's work. Um, uh, on the issue of prisons as institutions, um, it's, it's, it is an interesting comment on uh, the early roots of liberalism that the Benthamite Penopticon should have become the, the model for concentration camps um, around the world. Um, a, a, what would a conservative view, I can't speak for a post-liberal view, but a, a a conservative view um, would would all be about re-establishing the relationship between the individual and the social order. Um, and that's a slow process, um, and it absolutely requires education. It also requires fulfilling and sustaining work of some kind. Uh, and it involves the process of, of, of reintroducing people whom society has done, a, in many cases, a rather effective job of alienating to a notion of shared value and common norms. Um, and so it would, be, it would be facing on those kinds of things, I think. Right, Philip Don, could you well, three or four more minutes, then we've got to get. Sure. Oh, you've ran. Um, <clears throat> thank you. The remark about Council House is very interesting. Mrs. Thatcher is a very complex figure, and her interpreters have reduced her legacy, really. Actually, giving away council houses, which was one of the most popular policies, was actually coming straight out of Catholic social theory. Belloc and, and Chesterton, the notion of distributism, 
which isn't Ed Miliband's pre-distribution, but it's an idea that the primary, in order to enter a market, you have to have property. And where I do think there can still be distributist stroke Thatcherite possibilities in, is in the ongoing reality of government procurement. Yes, we don't have capital, absolutely, but we do have our purchasing decisions. And that's why, and here's a thumbs up for the government, Chris White's bill, Social Value Bill, attempts to allow small and local businesses, SMEs and social enterprises to also have a share of the public procurement cake. Under Blur, all public contracts went to essentially three companies, which was typically free market in its current understanding, and it created the monopoly. A radical tourism will break open public procurement and use the fact of procurement as an endowment that will allow market entry. Um, I agree with Jesse, I can't really top that. I'd probably be a little bit more radical. No, no, I'd agree with him. Mill got nothing right, and the only thing he got right was women's rights, and that didn't come from him. I mean, utilitarianism is the most bankrupt moral theory that there is. And it's bankrupt because it's utterly corrupt, because what it says is there are no objective values, and the only objective values are the aggregates of happiness that people do. I mean, I used to do this with first-year philosophy courses, so gang rape can be permissible if more people enjoy it than not. And so there's nothing really persuasive, and any of the reforms of act or rule-based utilitarianism basically don't work. Utilitarianism is nihilism, misrecognizing itself as, as moral, and it's to be rejected by all true radical conservatives, whether post-liberal or not. Um, and again, I really like Jesse's point. A, a, a post-liberal prison policy would be linking uh, people who've committed crimes with the social order. And um, I also think it involves thinking that some people might have breached that pretty permanently. And I think things like, you know, paedophiles, people engaged in, in, in violence, and things that in some sense they'll repeat, the social order needs permanently protecting from them. But for those that are in some sense redeemable, and, and then I think contact with the social order is how you redeem them. Scapegoating doesn't work, and Christianity, and I am a Christian, is all about overcoming the logic of scapegoating. Thank you. Thank you very much for the brilliant audience tonight and our panellists. Um, but I've been asked to advertise this amazing fringe tomorrow. I've been asked to advertise this amazing fringe tomorrow. We've got Bishop Nazirelli, Tim Montgomery, Matthew Paris, Andrew Pierce, and Philip Blonde debating uh, marriage, changing the terms of debate, and that happens at 10 a.m. So it's the gay Not... marriage debate tomorrow here at 10 a.m. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.